the Kane Prize for African Writing. I say annual because this is the second year we've held this event, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is organized in cooperation with the Lennon Center for Poetics and Social Practice at Georgetown University, which offers an annual residency for the Kane Prize winner. We also want to thank our local co-sponsors, the Heyman Center and the Institute for African Studies. I'm Jennifer Wenzel, Associate Professor in English and MISAS, and a member of the Board of Directors for the Society of Fellows, and I'm delighted to moderate tonight's event. And I should say that we were supposed to be joined uh, by Professor Yvette Christiansa, but she unfortunately had to cancel earlier this afternoon. So before introducing tonight's speaker, I wanted to say a few words about the Kane Prize in relation to African literature. The Kane Prize for African Writing was first awarded in the year 2000. Previous awardees for the annual prize include No Violet Boilueo from Zimbabwe, Helen Habila and Babatindi Bertini from Nigeria, and Ivan Owar and Binyavanga Wainena, both from Kenya. All of these writers have become household names in African literature. The very first Kane Prize was awarded to Leila Abulela from Sudan, also the home country of last year's Kane Prize winner, Bushra Al Fadil, who visited Colombia last year. The Kane Prize was founded in honor of the late Sir Michael Kane, former chairman of the Booker Company, the British company also behind the annual literary prize now known as the Man Booker Prize which is awarded annually to a novel written in English. The Kane Prize, which is awarded each year to a short story written in English, aims to expand the audience for African literature both on the continent and beyond by holding writers' workshops in Africa. I think this year's workshop was in Rwanda? Um, um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, okay. it was. Uh, by aiding in the local publication of shortlisted stories, by sponsoring the travel of authors whose short stories are shortlisted for the prize each year. According to the Kane Prize organizers, the decision to make an annual award for a short story by a writer from the African continent reflects, in their words, the contemporary development of the African storytelling tradition. Now, it's worth considering the various kinds of incentives and effects that this 10,000 pound annual prize for writing might create. Those of you familiar with Mark McGurl's book, The Program Era, on how creative writing programs in the US shaped fiction writing, or with Pascal Casanova's book, The World Republic of Letters, on the outsized influence of Paris within world literary space, or with the work of Graham Huggin and Sarah Boyette on the effects of the global literary marketplace, which can mean that post-colonial writing traffics in exoticism, or reads as if it does, and how those pressures of commerce and cultural prestige shape the very kinds of writing that gets produced, published, and reviewed. If you're familiar with those arguments, you will not be surprised to learn that there have been some similar concerns expressed about the Kane Prize. These are concerns about the feedback loops between judges and authors, the kinds of work that win the prize, and the kind of work that in turn gets produced. Nigerian critic Ikide Ikiloa has worried about what he calls a Kane Prize orthodoxy, in which, in his words, many writers are skewing their written perspectives to fit what they imagine will sell to the West and the judges of the Kane Prize. In other words, the kinds of questions that the sociology of literature asks about the power and influence exercised by publishers, editors, reviewers, and prize judges can intersect in a particularly urgent way with longer histories of imagining Africa from the outside and underlying the Western gaze, the longer history of Western imperialism. These are the unfortunate conventions of representation that Kane Prize winner Binyavanga Wainena satirized mercilessly in his infamous essay from 2005, How to Write About Africa. I want to suggest that one might also perceive in this year's winning story, Fanta Black Current, an oblique criticism of this troubling dynamic. I'm thinking of the story's repeated references to Good Samaritans and the savviness of the characters in the story who make appeals to the mercy of the Good Samaritans. With her story, Fanta Black Current, Makena Anjarika beat out the other writers on the 2018 shortlist, one South African and three Nigerians, always Nigerians on the list. Um, the chair of this year's panel of judges, the Ethiopian novelist Dina Magistu, offered high praise for Anjarika's work. He wrote, the winning story of this year's King Prize is as fierce as they come, 
a narrative forged but not defined by the streets of Nairobi, a story that stands as more than just witness. Makena Anjarika's Fanta Black Current presides over a grammar and an architecture of its own making, one that eschews any trace of sentimentality in favor of a narrative that is haunting in its humor, sorrow, and intimacy. So I think we're in for a treat tonight. So with no further ado, let me introduce to you Makena Anjarika, who is a graduate of the MFA Creative Writing Program at NYU and has published in the journals Urban Confusions and Wasafiri. It's in Wasafiri that Fanta Black Current was published in 2017. She lives in Nairobi and is currently working on a fantasy novel. Please welcome Makena Andrik. Thanks everyone for coming and also for waiting while I run around in circles. Uh, so I am actually going to read from your work. Um, and I think it's gonna um, balance out with sort of the, the questions that um, Ikide actually raises about um, our fiction. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just go. The story is titled Gal Pinocchio. Here we go. Mtinyari is 13 when she first takes her heart out of its bony cage. It is a frightened bird in her hand, an ugly thing, sleek with fat and slippery. Revulsion, thick and sour, holds at the back of her throat. She squeezes her heart, attempts to silence it in the vice of her fingers. Mother finds her fallen over, bent at an odd angle against the side of the bed a flimsy rag doll with collapsed legs. Her heart has rolled under the bed and is carrying in the farthest corner. Why would you do this? Mother's face ripples with restrained emotion. It wouldn't stop hurting. Mother's face dissolved, dissolves, but only for the briefest moment. It gathers together and solidifies into anger. What cause have you to be unhappy? She squeezes Tinari hard on the shoulders. I have given you everything. Tinari finds that guilt is a vicious rodent clawing at her from the inside. She fights herself to hold together. But at 15, she takes out and catalogues all her parts, searching for meaning. Kidneys, lungs, vagina, eyes. Though she puts back immediately, watching herself from the table is disorienting. Lips, spleen, ovaries, uterus, nose, stomach. It sloshes about with her half-digested breakfast, pancreas, ears, tongue, intestines, bladder, teeth. Outside, the sun slides off the sky into a pool of orange-pink foreboding. Everything is, pre is present, she thinks in the grey darkness. Everything is present. Not a single part is missing. Why is she still incomplete? She wants laughter to escape her in puffs of yellow, pink and blue as he does the other girls at the school. The energy of petty quarrels, jealousies, and desires buzzes about them, shooting off testy flares. If only she could be at the center of some controversy, going without a bra, spreading a rumor about someone having an SDI. She only succeeds in being a well-mannered, if awkward, blob of not too bad grades. On her worst days, she locks herself in her room, lies in bed, and torments her heart, prodding and poking it, enlarging its holes. She wants to scream a bright, luminous color onto her room's white walls, but all she can do is cry herself into a soup with bits of self-pity and dejection sprinkled in. At 16, she meets Kiku at a concert at which neither of them should be. Kiku is the kind of girl who loves who shouts, I love you, at the stage, then hides behind self-conscious giggling, even though no one looks her way. She also has a stud in the soft fold of her nostril, despite which mother likes her. She is on a merit-based scholarship at an international school, just the kind of inspiration Tinari needs to pull up her academic socks. She has very good skin. Ask her what she's doing to it, mother instructs in her particular off-hand voice one morning. Ntinyari's hand goes to her cheek. 
a new pimple is sprouting there, hard and stubborn. Her forehead is dotted with rash and black spots, and for several weeks now, a bursting white head has bejeweled the tip of her chin every morning. Lotions, scrubs, toners, powder, soap, cleansers, masks, detox. Nothing stops her pores from excreting thick, greasy sebum. She feels poisonous. You got your father's genes, says mother, with pity that rises to her eyes and furrows her brow. At their next leap over, Dinari stares longingly at Kiku's skin. She presses against the girl as they lie on their bellies on bed, watching a bootleg DVD on the laptop. Kiku's skin is whipped, silky coconut butter. Her face is wet from all the crying she's done, along with the character whose head, whose dad's head has just been chopped off. I can't help it, she says every time Tinari witnesses her osmos other people's emotions and this is why they are friend. What if you could take off your skin? Tinari asks. Interesting but also gross. What would you do? Kiku likes the idea. Her eyes narrow, her smile grows longer. Steal a shitload of money and never get caught? That's it? Cause what would you do? Tinari inhales. I actually can't. What are you talking about? I'll show you. And Tinari slips out of her skinny jeans and t-shirt, then her lacy bra, her lacy panties and bra. Kiku hides behind her hands. What are you doing? It's okay, just look. And Tinari reaches her hand to her back and feels for a zipper there, then draws it along the rail under her skin. It slips her It's, it slips her open halfway across her neck and then down her chest. Her ribs peer out, visible through red marbled muscle. She is approaching her navel when she recognizes the look on Kiku's face. This thing she, she is should never be shared. It should be kept private, in a place too deep for light. The look on Kiku's face says Ntinyari has been cruel in revealing her innards. This thing she is is too terrible to give another person. Ntinari is not surprised when Kiku vomits. What happened to your friend? Mother wants to know months later. She's tapping on her, on her skull with, a flat, with her flat palm. Ntinari imagines the sharp itch under mother's synthetic calicate weave like thousands of black ant bites or needle pricks. She imagines mother pulling off her head setting it between her knees and giving it a good scratch. As if reading Tinari's thoughts, mother pierces her with a look, don't you dare. But Tinari could not take off her head, even if she wanted to. It is firmly fixed to her neck, to her torso. And although mother doesn't say anything about her brain, it too is safely out of her reach, encased in a bolted down skull. And her microscope, she finds that her nerve cells have tails like mucus pulled out of her child's nose. Her blood cells could be donuts. Her muscle cells worms. Her bone cells spiders. Her skin cells blocks of gummy sweets stuck together. And yet, nothing is out of the norm here. She pulls away from the microscope and rubs her eyes with her fist. A dull pain creeps up her back between her shoulder blades. She's 20 and behind her, on a laboratory's cold slab lies a cadaver. His face and chest are hidden under a blue sheet as if to shield him from the indignity of what is happening to the rest of him. She and the other first year medical students have been picking him apart for four months now. After every session, the pain in Tinari's back escalates into a smoldering spot of lava. The others are eating lunch next to him, she says to brother in Boston. Sometimes I dream I am him, she says to sister in Johannesburg. With each conversation, she, she feels that she is spewing dark emotional fluid across the world, but she cannot stop it from bubbling up and leaking out of her. They try to understand, to comfort, to solve the Rubik's Cube she has become. You can do this. You scored an A in biology. He's dead. He can't feel anything. Mother is going to be really sad about this in tea. And so she trudges along. Things will get better if she just tries harder. She ends every night, 
every morning, staring at herself in the mute black screen of her laptop. She's a composite of God's leftover pieces, large moist eyes, a short rounded nose with bean shaped nostrils, act eyebrows, Kiku used to call her girl surprised, a small mouth and ears flattened against her head. While her roommate snores in her half of their hostel room, she tries to pry her skull open again and again to reach at the thing that is broken inside her. One night, a screw pops and flies off into her roommate's blanket, but alas, the six others are bolted down tight. She takes her head in her hands and shakes it too hard. Something comes loose and henceforth rattles around her skull. I'll stop there. <laughs> place and then they end up in a completely different place. Same thing happened with Fanta Placard. So I really actually cannot remember. <laughs> I I don't know why I was so in, interested in like mechanical stuff at the time. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I noticed there are lots of um, that image of fluids and bodily Um, I can't tell you the end of the story or what's happening to this girl, but a lot of that is how she feels about herself and her body. Um, the sense of being sort of incomplete, dirty, messed up, and so she thinks continuously of herself in that way. Yes? Um, I'm going to ask you a genre question. Yes. The story of Phantom Black Currents is in some ways very much a realist kind yes. of story. Um, and it sounds like you're shifting more towards fantasy. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, sort of your reasons for that move, or how you're thinking about the, the shift from one to the other. Actually, writing a realist fiction is something that's newer in my writing than mm -hmm. uh, writing fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was in school with those lovely three ladies <laughs> back there, and we were all fantasy writers in the same, in the same group. So I've always written fantasy. My first um, sort of amateur novel at 15 was fantasy. I'm just going back. Okay, because um, I think that's the halfway point of, of this story, and it's also a new work that I'm hoping to get out and publish, so I, I didn't want to take everything away, uh, you know, from, from you guys when it's actually published. And also, um, it probably needs more revision, so, um, yeah. so it's something I'm, I'm working on continuously. So when it's done, done, uh, then we'll be able to... But this sense of it, it, it's sort of halfway done, or yeah. this is sort of midpoint. That yeah, this, this is definitely the midpoint of the story. Uh, more crazy stuff happening. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I like the echo of, uh, or I hear it as an echo of, of you kind of tinkering with the story and the parts of the story and how they're meant to fit together and mm -hmm. what they're meant to do together. And, it's not exactly that this character is tinkering with herself, but yes. that, you know, she is kind of, you know, I, I suppose I, I, I still uh, am open with the genre question in terms of you suggested, I don't want to push you too hard, but mm -hmm. how we're meant to, to read the, the actuality of the fantasy, mm -hmm. I guess I might say. So, you know, you open with a kind of catalog of, of body parts um, and which I think one can hear as metaphorical at first and then the, the suggestion of it's actually happening. And I have to say that is the place where I, like I'm sitting here I'm trying to think of how the story is similar to the Fanta Black Current story. 
And that, I think, is the thing that I would point out as the similarity is the catalog, right? The, like, the use of the list. Um, and that, I forget, I'm not enough of a like, good English major to remember the early modern term for the catalog of body parts that, that in a sonnet. Yeah. Anyone have that? <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's, I yeah. Sure I <laughs> I remember you. Long time ago, but the idea, you know, that the writer of a sonnet, you know, praises the, the various body parts of the lover, right? That's that's one version oh, of the catalog okay. of body what parts. Yeah. Russia. <laughs> it's is it the blazon? Oh, uh, it is. Yeah. It is. It okay. is the blazon. Yeah. 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 So the the you know the catalog yeah. of yeah of, of adored body parts, and it's not that there's a blazon in Phantom Black Current, but I think that's part of the to my mind at least, that's part of the way that Fanta Black Current works, is as each, par not each paragraph, but you have these wonderful paragraphs that are lists of things, either that the same people are doing, mm -hmm. or that different people are doing, and, and it's, it's, that's a lot of the work of that story, yeah. it's kind of lists of actions. Yeah. Uh, or even, like I didn't hear it so much as an emphasis on body fluids, but that the list of, list of uh, skin products and skin issues is another bit of that kind cataloging impulse. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not really a question, but um, yeah. it, is there something that you can say about that interest in uh, the multiplicity of things? Well, actually, until now, I hadn't um, like realized that the, the two stories have cataloging. Yeah. But, but you're right. There's a lot of cataloging in, in, um, in Fanta Black Art yeah. and here as well. Um, I guess it's just a um, I would say it's a writing tick that I have. Mm -hmm. um, I do like, you know, maybe it's laziness even. Like, I get to a point, I'm like, okay, words, words, words over here, <laughs> and then we get back to the story. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, here's an interesting thing. So, this story um, only became a fantasy story when I read it at Georgetown just like a week ago. When I wrote it, it was not a fantasy story. To me, it was a story uh, you're supposed to understand me. When you get to the end of the story, <laughs> then you will know that it's not actually like a, I don't know how to explain it. Um, but it, someone pointed it out to me, and I was like, "Wow, this is actually the story that's me transitioning into fantasy writing um, in short fiction." Because in my mind, it's always been like my longer work is fantasy. That's what I enjoy trying to create. And then my shorter work has always been very realist because I studied short story writing specifically at MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what the bulk of what we did there. So they've been always separate to me, and this story is a surprise to me as well. I, I didn't really think it was going to be a What was the hardest part about, I guess, writing in general, but more specifically writing the story? Um, Actually, this story was not a hard story to write. <laughs> it's funny, I got it out in like um, a week or something, and mm -hmm. I'm just generally a person who works on the same story for years. Like Phantom La Current, I started in 2012 when I was in grad school, and then I worked on it like over and over in 2013, and sent it out. Um, and then I was so tired of it that when the publisher sent me the um, so it took five years between the time I sent them the story and the time they published it. So um, both of both sides were just like, ah, whatever, we'll get to it. Um, and then, so when they finally told me, okay, look at this before we publish, I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it got shortly sent for the K Pride. And I was like, ah, horror, <laughs> time <laughs> uh, So they actually just put up a new the revised version of the story on the website, I think, today. Uh, and I'm very happy. Because now, every time I go into this meeting, uh, I don't know if anyone has a copy of it. Um, if you read the first sentence right there, like the first line, uh, let me see. So, you see that, see that, see that, you see yeah, that yeah. comma? Yeah. That disturbs me. The first <laughs> sentence, and there's just a comma that's misplaced, and I really just want to, so now that I got them to take it down and, and change it, I'm happy. Uh, long detour, but yes, some stories are super fast and easy. Uh, I really have a challenge. Um, so I'll, I'll have a nice idea in my head, and then I start writing it, and I get halfway, and I'm like, ah. But this one was just like, I knew from beginning to end like how it was.
that's what I work in. So. Mm -hmm. Can I ask yeah, you? No, sorry, I can see the question. Yeah. I was just going to say, I like the, the effect of, because what I'm thinking is, it's kind of like Kafka, very deadpan, very kind of like, and then she cut herself up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and why not? And it's kind of gross, but she didn't think so, but yeah. her friend did. Yeah. Um, but it kind of, I like the whole literalizing of experience mm -hmm. and the, the laziness of lists to me is not lazy, it's sort of one of the things people do to be look realistic, yeah. and like why not, mm -hmm. but it doesn't amount to anything. Yeah. I mean, I was going to ask you just if you could talk a little more broadly about, um, you said that you started out writing fantasy, mm -hmm. and if you could just talk about um, how your own trajectory in speculative or is different from what feels like a recent turn to writing fantasy speculative fiction mm -hmm. uh, among writers from the continent. Um, yeah. uh, and w the other part of that question would be uh, how that uh, the trend, but that, that tendency, I think, um, is complicated. I think you were gesturing toward this uh, about the King Price mm -hmm. aesthetic. Um, complicates the, the, the kind of um, overwhelming realist impulses of so much um, writing. Uh, you know, the funny thing is, I would say that magical elements have been only a very strong part of um, African writing. Um, they are all these things that happen in them that just seem magical, that they're, they're not exactly realist. And so I think what's happened uh, a bit more recently is sort of um, writing fantasy in a more Western mm -hmm. way, I, I would mm -hmm. say, but that, that's always been continuing. So I, I mean, I mean, it's an exciting entry, and these questions of how then, do you, how do you write that kind of fantasy in a very African way? Um, for me, um, I grew up reading all this fantasy and science fiction, which I, I guess is how fantasy mm -hmm. writers start. Um, and the book that got me writing uh, was actually not fantasy. It was fantasy. Actually, it was fantasy. Uh, what's uh, it's called? This book by Anthony Hope. The second one is called um, Rupert of Hansel. Uh, it has this guy who goes to a place called Ruritania and he finds himself as a queen. Do you know what book I'm talking about? Mm. I can't remember the names. <laughs> Hurry. Uh, Prison, of, Prison of Zender. Oh. Yeah. If, has anyone read that? It's like one of those, it's a tiny book. And then, so I, w I was very much reading that kind of, of book. Mm -hmm. And you also realize that if I'm reading Jane Austen, Jane Austen is very fantastical to me because it's from a whole <laughs> different place, you know? And then they're wearing all these clothes and they spend all their time mm -hmm. thinking about you know, who they're gonna marry, which is, which, is, which is fun when I was a teenager, yeah? <laughs> so that, a lot of the sto because a lot of the stories I was reading were actually a part of my experience. They were kind of fantasy, mm -hmm. so that when I started writing, it just seemed like the place to go. And I got really annoyed at Anthony Hope for that particular book um, because there's this very handsome man. He manages to like um, take up the role of the king because the king is just lazy and gets kidnapped. Blah 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 blah. And then this guy finally will end up could end up with a queen because the king dies at some point and we forget about him. And I get killed. And I'm so pissed off. I was like, hold up, I'm gonna actually write my story in which like handsome men don't die. <laughs> so that's how I started writing. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a really good place to start. I think for a lot of Americans who end up writing, my, my friends included, I think fantasy is sort of that, fan fiction is sort of that entry level. So, that my approach or into fiction has been, I would say, a very American approach, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting, because I was, as I was listening to you read and trying to um, make sense of, of what generic universe we were in, mm -hmm. I, uh, I was thinking, uh, you put some line, uh, God's uh, 
God's leftover pieces, um, which took me to Frankenstein, but I had already, you know, come building a, a person out of leftover pieces, but I'd already been thinking about uh, Amos Tuchelo's The Palm Line Drinker mm -hmm. and the image of the complete gentleman. Mm -hmm. And what, what's different in, in that figure is uh, that the head is, is, is one of the things that comes off of oh. the complete gentleman, right? Yeah. So I was fascinated by the idea that you mm -hmm. couldn't, couldn't lose the head. But <coughs> the, what you were just saying about the text that inspired you, President Azenda, is I was thinking, you know, between, not that these influence you, but just making sense of, of texts that work in similar ways. Mm -hmm. Frankenstein, Tutuola, but from the perspective of a young woman and yeah. her kind of thinking through body image things. Yeah. So it's a really wonderful kind of spin. So he, I have to make a confession here. I am not a fan of Tutuola. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just wish someone had edited his work much more. <laughs> and I know that the, a lot of people within the African literary circle who feel that his work is great and yet it exemplifies like African writing in a way and I'm just like bite my fingers and I'm like, oh, I don't I don't agree. And yes you can give a comment about that. <laughs> um, yeah. I've tried reading the palm while drink like drinker and you know it, there's a sentence there that just kind of falls off and continues and I think it's an interesting approach to creativity but I, uh, <clears throat> so I won't say about anything about Palm Wine Drinker, but I wanted to talk uh, uh, to talk about uh, Famish Road. Mm. Um, mm. Now it's kind of I find it fantastical, but I find it also very much connected to like Nigerian experience, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. whether it's cultural or politics. So uh, I wonder if the price that African literature has to pay for going like like accepted into the you know American or mainstream you know fantasy is a divorce or separation from that experience that mm -hmm. it becomes and as I was listening I was thinking about like is this just going to be uh, another you know fantasy story of kind of Americanized or globalized mm -hmm. version mm -hmm. then is it just written because written by Africans, is that what makes it African? Mm. So this is something I wanted to... Interesting. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, so we have people like, um, in my country, for example, we have like Ngugi Wathiyong, yeah? And Ngugi Wathiyong has made a very strong call for years mm -hmm. and years for us to write in our uh, African languages. Mm -hmm. But then I grew up in Nairobi, okay? I understand my mother's language and she speaks it to me, but she doesn't even write it. <laughs> so... I don't write it. It's it's part of my experience, but not in the way Kikuyu has been part of his experience. Mm -hmm. So, one, there is that idea of like, are we trying to Americanize sort of our fantasy? And two, it's that our experience of the world today is very different sort of from what Ben Okri is writing. I do not have that um, access that he, you know, his generation would have to sort of those stories that inspired the kind of production that they, that they did. And then, you know, comes up the question of should I look for those things? And my question to you is, I mean, whether I speak English or some other language, I am an African. Like, I do not feel the need to actually quantify that. I, I live in Nairobi, I was born in Nairobi. My experiences, within the space that is Nairobi are African experiences and they're new experiences and they are very much at a crossroads of all sorts of cultures. So I think there are writers who are gonna commit themselves to, you know, the traditional approach of writing African uh, literature and then there are gonna be writers like me who just pick and choose from wherever. So I feel very um, close in my writing to Indian writers like Amit Jothuri, uh, you know, if you've read, uh, is it, I think it's Sweet Sublime Address, that experience, that book is what my childhood felt like, you know, or Bruno Schultz from Poland. His sort of fantastical stories are so exactly how my childhood was. 
So where where is my obligation or my duty? Do I write to my experience today, now, here, the ones that I'm actually experiencing, or do I write to my perceived experiences? Mm -hmm. African experiences. It's a tough one. You had a question, I think. Yeah, so it's kind of jumping off of that. So by choosing to write in English, but writing about lower income, like street children in Nairobi, mm -hmm. how do you bridge that gap for writing for maybe a higher income audience that speaks and reads and writes English, mm -hmm. but taking from experiences of lower income people who perhaps can't read the work? Read my work. <sighs> Difficult. Because I actually don't even know that people will read my work in Kenya, Kenya itself. Um, there is a, a sort of a group of, a very strong group of a lot of people who are exchanging books and book swaps, very, but it's a certain group of people, like a certain class of people in Nairobi. Um, so when I write, I honestly don't think about, okay, this is going to be my audience. Um, I do want Kenyans to feel you know, represented in my work, whether they're from which income level, which is why Fanta Black Current is very much about that language and that sort of beat. Um, and I find it creatively um, just energizing to go for that language. I have written some other stories in it. But at the same time, I want to be understood by, by the world. Um, so there's always that interplay be between those two, and I can't honestly answer the question other people, other classes of people in Kenya do ever get access to the book. So um, you said that you, when you first started writing was that fantasy and then the short stories were more realistic and the novels were. So is there something about, let's see, is it, is it sort of a move back to a genre that you think that will continue to, to write in you know, sort of for the near future? Or is it there's something syncopated about the short stories lend themselves mm -hmm. to sort of more realistic treatment? Or something? Yeah, this so good. it's like a dual thing that I'm, I'm doing. Like when, when I apply myself to my longer work, right now it's, just, it's fantasy that I'm interested in trying to create. I'm, interested in stuff like by N.K. Jemisin. Mm -hmm. she's, she's doing some really great work in that space. Um, Essay Chakraboti, uh, Tasha Suri, they're all this um, non-white, non-American writers who are working in fantasy and I'm interested in their, their particular approach and writing work like that. Um, and then my literary fiction just, it just, it's short. I, I can't imagine sustaining that much um, writing for that long, like a long book. Can you follow up question about just, um, you said your MFA was in the short story. Mm -hmm. um, how much would you say that's sort of a very laborious feeling about the short story genre? Mm -hmm. It has to do with uh, the formal study of it in the, the context of an MFA program. Yeah. Uh, so, I left my MFA in 2013 and I quit writing for five years. I would never have started writing again if I hadn't been shortlisted for the King Prize. And I mean, it was a happy accident because of this long publishing process that happened for Quantum Lakai. So uh, I found the MFA to be very stressful and a lot of it is that I went from being an undergraduate uh, to being a master's student, just immediately. So there was no time to actually write and produce. And then I got into a program that's very focused on editing. Uh, the MFA is not about um, writing, you know. Writing you do on your own, then you come into class and you learn mainly how to edit. So when I left, I really just could not get the editor in my head out. And it became so stressful, I was like, yeah, it's not worth it. So I, I left it. So you could say, and, and this may answer your question as well, that uh, fantasy is a place of comfort for me. It's writing that I know 
I can do and it will flow and it will work. And then on occasion I'll have a story like Gal Pinocchio that just, it just comes and it clicks. But that's very rare. Um, I think I'll, I'm the kind of person who will write one short story a year. more general story, just in terms of, um, I've studied the Kenyan literary scene itself, uh, in the contemporary moment, right? We have, like we mentioned earlier, we have the generation of who was still not right? And so thinking about the Kenyan literary scene, I could make a disagreement, I'm, I'm probably not wrong, mm -hmm. more familiar with it than I am, but it seems to me that a generation like you was sort of trying to shift it, because for a long time, the literary scene in Kenya has been very massless, right? Mm -hmm. It's been very male oriented. So one you know, one there's one or two female writers who like probably go back go back to the post colonial moment. Yeah yeah. So like I guess I'm asking like what are your politics in terms of uh, shifting, you know, the way um, uh, literature works in Kenya, right? And so maybe speak to that mm. if you have any politics at all. I I, I don't have. Mm. I'm sure I have politics, like, but not nothing that I've sat down and sort of thought about. And that's an interesting observation. Interesting enough, I don't think that we've really gotten to that place where there are many female writers in, in Kenya. You know, you have Yvonne Awar, you have Iman Varje, but if you look at the big writers now who are really like known, say for example the Enkare group. And the Jalada group, this, it's still very, very strongly male. Um, but the question of trying to sort of shift uh, from the Ngugi or Kyoma generation, who are very political writers, uh, they, you know, they were very political writers, very social uh, writers, um, serious people, actually, I would say. Um, and for me, I've never been able to turn to say Ngugi Wathiyama for inspiration. He just feels like he's from a very different world and from the kind of things that are my concerns. Uh, so I see more and more with younger writers trying to sort of say, we need to get out from under Ngugi mm -hmm. uh, And so, if, you know, I had a, like a BBC was doing a recording for radio the other day and they asked us, okay, so who's Who's the person who's inspired you? And you know, were four on the panel, and then three writers on the panel actually mentioned Mija Mwangi, mm -hmm. who's sort of uh, very different from Gugi in that he, yes, wrote a lot about social issues, but he wrote about the street a lot. You know, life in the street, and uh, people were car. Uh, the car his characters were actually people, not very much like issues. Are, and, and that's been sort of the interesting way for most of us with, with Kenyan uh, literature. And then I, I, I am worried of writing stories now about uh, the struggle between the city and the, and, the, and the rural area, which was a huge theme for those, those writers. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, in some ways, I agree with all these people who are calling for African writers to sort of push the boundaries in what topics we're covering and how you know, we're looking at these topics. And then I disagree with some of them. Um, like uh, when my story was shortlisted, um, Ikide was one of the people who, you know, he called it a riff off of Novale Kulewayo's uh, uh, Hit in Budapest. Mm -hmm. um, and then quite some, some other colorful things. Um, <laughs> And then, and then very recently we've had like brittle paper come out and say, you know, African writers need to move beyond these topics. And I'm like, how do you move this beyond topic, this beyond these topics, when you live in a place? You know, I live in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. Poverty is a constant thing that is in my face. Mm -hmm. And for example, street kids in Nairobi, yeah, you know, Novale Dulawayo has written a story like that, but he hasn't talked about Kenyan street kids. Mm -hmm. And you could say so many, you can write that story a million times. Because maybe some one of the things we're trying to do with it is say to ourselves and to the people around us in Kenya that we have not addressed this issue. Mm -hmm. um, 
so yeah, I'm I'm just yes, I wanna explore explore new places, but I I don't feel like if you wake up in the morning and you decide to write that same story that's been written a million times, that there's a problem with that. Um, because that kind of policing of what you write does not happen with any other writers in the world. No one tells Americans that they are writing way too much about 9-11, you know, <laughs> or some other, what's the other topic you guys are writing so much? <laughs> Small time Sabavia issues, you know, <laughs> World War II, you know. No, no one does, no one says that, but then I guess, I guess we're, we're not so many writers in Africa that the ones who are like at the top are required to pre represent the continent and make sure everything is covered. The only thing you can do is maybe teach more people to, to, to do writing. I'm so glad that you mentioned Major Monkey because I, I was kind of uh, hatching a hypothesis that uh, the, the nation state is not the, the scale that you identify with as a writer because you've mentioned you know so many writers from so many places but I was thinking about his work um, mm -hmm. reading uh, Phantom Black, Black Current, Current. Not, yes. not the story that you read today yeah. um, and and I, I, there's something that is really powerful about his novels um, which are as you've said accounts of, of the street in Nairobi in the and 70s very accessible much more accessible than anything yeah, but the the difference is that um, he's kind of wonderful on like male homosexuality mm -hmm. and horrible <laughs> on women. Yes, <laughs> just like, like comically horrible. Yeah. And so as I was reading Phantom Black Current, I was like, you know, this is maybe a, a corrective, or you know, this is the kind of thing that Major Mongi might have written had he. Not been so hostile to, to yeah. women. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm just delighted to, to hear you mention him yeah. as, as an influence. Yeah. And I'm also very interested in Nairobi as a space. Yeah. Uh, because Nairobi used to be, before the British got there, it used to be a watering hole mm -hmm. for uh, the Maasai hands and cattle. And, and then you have the railway uh, stopping there and it grew into this space and it's very different I would say from sort of how the city probably works here. So the, the thing we call town or the city center is more like um, Wall Street, someone talk, yeah, Sharon, Wall Street, yeah. So it's like, it's a place where people gather, work and then leave. So there's this, this space and the only people who actually live there are either people in hotels or it's a street kids and, and street families. So that space is what I was, I was looking at, it's, yeah? And then you have these other spaces, and, and one of the things I struggle about when I just think, okay, if this work is gonna be read like, by Americans, um, how do I explain how you know, space works in Nairobi? Because I think it works very different. Yeah. Even your houses, like I look at your houses and they are so straight, you know, and so like, boxy, and it's very different in my country. Like, so being in America has was at that time part of that looking back that was very helpful. Every time I come here or I've been here, I've been able to sort of look back and and, and see that that distance has been helpful. Um, and I was telling someone that I could never write about America, like a, a character based here, it's because it's such, it's a such a surreal experience being in America. Random deviation. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess what I'm trying to 
not being a, let's say, you may be a national writer, but if you were not to be just a national writer, mm -hmm. um, what other kinds of spaces might come into that, right? I mean, it's you know, places around you, other cities, mm -hmm. you know. Actually, I am not even a national writer. Mm -hmm. I am yes. definitely a Nairobi writer. Okay. Uh, if I write anything that really is at all, it's in Nairobi. Because, you know, just outside Nairobi is completely different. And also, that it's, it's my part of Nairobi. So, I think I would sort of have to have... I have not yet been able to have that leap in my mind of that it is possible to me, for me to write about the east of Nairobi. Because I grew up in the uh, sort of north and now in the west of, of Nairobi. And the east of Nairobi has its own massive culture that I've never uh, plugged into. And do I feel the pressure to be more than just uh, one little segment of Nairobi writer? No, I don't. because. I think I can do that very well, and I can represent that space. Uh, and what I've been doing or trying to do, because I am interested in seeing stories from writers who have had other experiences within Nairobi and within Kenya and within Africa, is that I'm actually teaching a creative writing class in Nairobi, and I am currently on my second cohort of students. And they come from all over Nairobi and all sorts of experiences. I think other people will write those, those stories. Yeah, I, 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 not less, I didn't mean that you felt particular pressure. Yeah. Um, as much as the, the, the King Prize for African Literature, I guess mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to say, is that there's a part between you, you write about Nairobi, mm -hmm. but it, it clearly has an audience that resonates with you know, people beyond. And so I guess part of it was I'll talk about this sort of from a reading point of view, because what I've realized is that, so a book that I really love is um, Ancestor Stones by Aminata Fona. It's best, it's based in Sierra Leone. But when I read that book, I felt like she was talking to my experience, uh, like she was talking about my ancestors. Uh, maybe because I don't have that kind of access to stories about my ancestors. So I spent, I just actually spent this past week uh, buying all these books uh, so that I could have hard copies of them because they are not on Kindle yet. Trying to find every single book on Kindle that talked about interior East African pre-colonial history and there are like five books written about that. And then there's one article specifically about my people in, in Kenya. But, but there's something about stories being, uh, experiences being similar across the continent but also different. And, and varied. Uh, and I think that people would, the, the thing that makes people sort of say, oh, you're an African writer, is because there's a, there's a group of experiences that's very much sort of present and belonging to the, to the continent. That's what would sort of make us African writers. And then, okay, you end up in some issues like, okay, someone like Tope or Follarin, who won the King Prize in, was it 2013? His parents are Nigerian, but he grew up in America. And he's been here all his life. And his experience of Africa has only been sort of spending six weeks in, in Cape Town, and a few holidays in Nigeria. Uh, and he, is he an African writer, or is he not an African writer? He identifies as an African writer. Uh, and, and so that, that identity thing is complicated for other people, and they think about it a lot. But I somehow don't have to think about it. And I just, you know, I have my little niche place that I'm writing out of, and it satisfies me. I don't know whether that answers your question. Yeah, I, it was I asked you to kind of reflect on that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Um, so you had mentioned a while ago this question of trying to write a uniquely African kind of fantasy, and I was thinking about recently I just finished uh, Black Leopard, Red Wolf by Marlon James, which. Curious to hear your thoughts, but uh, more specifically, um, you, he's trying to like kind of assemble all these different 
you know, kind of historical, you know, myths and legends from around the continent into a thing that isn't set in any particular country, mm -hmm. but is, you know, mm -hmm. very uniquely African. And I'm mm -hmm. curious, when you are writing fantasy, are you thinking of, are you, you know, explicitly drawing on, you know, particular, you know, myths or stories, like, or what, where does your sort of inspiration material come from for fantasy? Um, so I spend some time here in the museums. Mm -hmm. I really love going in and seeing African art. I don't know. I, I, I hope that we've all, you know, had a stop at the Met or something mm -hmm. and, and looked at some of the collections there. Um, and it's for me, it's a, more like um, something that I'm drawing in. Um, I'm not thinking at this point about specific um, African myths that I can draw on, mm -hmm. but they. How do I say this? It's it's there already. It, it's part of me, and it does come out on its own. So for example, in this uh, particular story that I read today, um, the, th the thing about God's leftover pieces, yeah. that's something people say all the time in, in Nairobi about how you know God actually assembled us and s slapped your ears on and, and you know, um, if you don't like how you look, you know, saying that God was in a hurry and was making you suffer mm -hmm. like that. And it's something that kids will throw at each other and you know, insult each other. So. I think those things come out, and what I what I'm more interested in is sort of exploring the different. I do go like around the continent and sort of uh, try to read about different places, especially prehistoric, uh, not prehistoric but pre pre-colonial mm -hmm. spaces, and then in my mind those things match together and maybe produce something new. That's what I mean mm -hmm. by uh, African inspired. Yeah. Question picking up on that theme of going to a museum and seeing that kind of support inspiration, uh, and then walking into the, the the current issue of French uh, desires to repatriate some uh, African art, mm -hmm. uh, and hearing your own story just now about the inspiration that it provides you, do you see the impact that repatriated artifacts and art will have on other writers or on, uh, mm -hmm. in different regions of Africa? I feel very sad that I have to come to America. That, uh, work. Um, that it's held hostage in America and, the, and then that it's not stuff that was given for you for you time. I like I appreciate the idea of the museum, a place where you can go and see an array of things. But I mean this is not work that was given for you time. Uh, and then it comes out of cultures that were not creating it to be sort of put behind a, a glass cage. Uh, a lot of the stuff that is in this museum is actually religious artifacts that were, that they are taking away, you know, they're being taken away actually was a taking away of a piece of religion or, a, or something that held the culture together. And, and that's a problem to me. So I am glad that they're going to be repatriated. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that they will be taken care of in the countries they're going to. And that's one of the big issues that debates. But then you have to realize that a culture has to have the right to do with its things, what it does with them. Because they own those things past before the world owns them. Um, so it's one of those, I don't know whether I've answered. My particular yeah. opinion is that yes, they should, they should come back and that they would enrich. You know, like literally, there are so many people in my country who have never seen African art. Mm -hmm. They do not realize that we have created this massively innovative thing. Like, you just, you know, and or or the fact that a lot of um, and, and I mean, this is not the fault of the libraries here that are holding these books, but the fact that a lot of uh, books that were printed in the 60s and 70s in Africa, I got access to them here. Mm -hmm. I have to come to a library here to get them, and that's because copies were never kept or newspapers were never kept in our archives or that kind of thing. Um, it's just sad. Other questions? Can I let's 
is like full of politics, and you think of politics. Mm -hmm. And thinking about the piece we just read, or part of the work you just read, in terms of uh, your character, I assume, uh, desire, the desire for completeness, mm -hmm. for wholeness, and so sort of think that as um, a metaphor for where anything politically right, mm -hmm. there's a lot of garbage, right? Literally yes. speaking, so yes, true. true. So when I have you read, when you're reading your story, your, your, your work, I kept thinking about realistically, this is what Nairobi looks like. This is how the Kenyan politics feel like. So do you see your work sort of in a way mirroring that lived experience or in the Kenyan politics? Um, the answer to that is that I am always amazed by the things that people find in my work. Um, so, like, no, I have never thought about it that way, but yes, I can see how that would be, like, true of, of this story and the comparison with Nairobi and sort of the politics. Like, um, just the idea that that country keeps sort of falling apart, like, it's, it's a body and it just keeps falling apart. and. No one knows how to fix it, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I set out to do my work, I think sometimes that there are these topics that interest me. So like, for example, um, at that point when I was writing Front of the Current, the lives of street kids interested me. And it occurred to me that I had lived as a child in Kenya and I had been a child. But the children like her, Wachokora, they were not children. They were, they were a nuisance. They, and, and that really bothered me for the first time. And sort of, Fanta Black Current is an atonement of never seeing those children. And sort of saying to Kenya, look, we never see those children, their children. That's why uh, in this story, there's a specific, very, I very insistent on the childish, childishness of these teenagers. Okay? They are, you know, at the point where they could get pregnant, blah, blah, but they're also very childish. And so, when I heard about sort of uh, so what, what the King Price judges said about the story, I was like, wow, I wrote that, wow, okay. <laughs> I will take it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think maybe there's a difference between writing and literature in that writing and what I teach my students is very focused on like craft, how do you get the sentence down, how do you get the thing that's in your head on paper, and so we do all this work and we finish it and we send it into the world and there's the process of interpretation that then comes in with sort of literary analysis and, and people actually reading it. You as the readers bring a lot to the story. So people have talked to me about humor in Fanta Black Current. I'm like, that's just a depressing story. I don't know where you get humor in there, but apparently people see it. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, it's been, thank you so much for your reading. And thank and you for your having generosity me. and answering our questions. So please uh, join me and, uh, and thank you. Oh, okay. Miss, okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I know you had that question. <laughs> oh, do, do you want a last question? No, no, no. Are you sure? All right. Please join me in thanking the keynote.